to it. I'd like to introduce our panel moderator. This is a Professor Steve Sowoff, and he is from the finance area, and he's going to moderate the panel. And then afterwards, um, I'm sure some of the panelists, panelists will stick around if we want to network, because we all know how important networking is for small business and personal jobs. And uh, I believe we have some snacks for you as well. So I'm going to turn the panel over to Professor Sowoff. Thanks. Uh, thank you for joining us today, uh, panelists and students, uh, for the Ask the Professional uh, panel uh, in finance. We're pleased to welcome the panelists and alumni back to Mason to help our current students understand how their School of Business majors may translate into future careers. Uh, the panel is designed to give you firsthand insights into the opportunities that are available, the current employment market, a variety of work environments, and other valuable information. We encourage you to get involved and ask questions. Uh, we'll run the panel in three stages. Uh, first, I'll ask, e I'll ask each of our panelists uh, to give a brief introduction. After those introductions, we have a few prepared questions to get started. Uh, and then after that, uh, we encourage you to ask your own questions. Uh, so we'll go ahead um, in a second. The one thing I'll ask uh, panelists, if um, Try to keep the um, answers brief because we want to try and get through as much as we possibly can. So the more um, I spend less on talking like this and the more we can get through stuff. So um, if you guys could introduce yourself, uh, give us an overview of your education, your career, uh, and what you're up to to help our students uh, get to know you a little bit better. And I guess we could start uh, with uh, Judy and just work our way down the table. Good morning, everyone. My name is Judy Redpath. I own a financial planning business called Vista Wealth Strategies, LLC. I'm a 1984 MBA graduate of George Mason University and uh, overeducated. I also have a bachelor's degree from Indiana University in French and a master's degree in West European Studies from Indiana. So if you want to know if your career path will be in a straight line, I'm here to tell you no, it won't. That's the first thing. Keep your ears and your eyes open at all times. Um, I came into this business about 21 years ago. I'd been after a successful careers in business consulting, some policy work in healthcare, and then a lot of work in tech, technology consulting and sales. Uh, again, nothing's a straight line. I was lucky enough to find my way into this business and uh, um, plan on doing it for a long time to come. You need to be passionate about whatever you do, whether it's going to school, working, being part of your family. And as we talk about this, just know that you're going to be uh, doing about five or seven different careers during your life. And uh, we'll talk about that later if anybody wants to check in with me. Thanks, Judy. Uh, my name is Scott Clark. I'm Senior Vice President and Treasurer at Eagle Bank, which is a $7 billion community bank headquartered in Bethesda, Maryland. You might have seen our signs on the former Patriot Center, now the Eagle Bank Arena. Um, I got my undergraduate degree from George Mason in economics in 2002 and my MBA with the finance concentration from George Mason uh, in 2008. So I don't know any other university besides this one. Um, my job experience day-to-day uh, -day entails liquidity management, so wholesale funding and the bank's bond portfolio and then interest rate risk management, the more technical and mathematical side of it, trying to manage the balance sheet and adjust for the kinds of assets and liabilities that our lenders and our deposit gatherers are putting on. And uh, turn it over to Will. Thanks, Scott. Hey, guys. Uh, good morning. My name is Will Tabry. Um, I graduated from James Madison University in 2007. Um, and then uh, I got my MBA for, from the Robert H. Smith School of Business in the uh, University of Maryland in 14, and then uh, also pursued uh, my CFA designation. And I, uh, I guess a little bit of history, uh, my career path. <clears throat> After graduating JMU, I, I really, you know, even though I did really well in my finance classes, I re kind of really didn't really know what finance really meant or what all the options were that were available for me, and, and I presume that you guys are kind of in the same situation as I was many years ago. Um, and then I was approached by a friend, uh, Fannie Mae was recruiting at my school, and I was like, huh, I, I didn't know anything about them, never heard the name before. Um, and I was like, let me, let me read up on this company, and, and I was surprised to learn that uh, they had such a big impact on our economy. Um, 
And so I prepared for the job interview, and I was fortunate enough to, to land the job at Fannie Mae. And that's where I really had an in-depth understanding and appreciation of, of how the financial markets and finance can impact our day-to-day -day lives. Um, I started there, and it was part of a rotation program. So every you know few few years, I kind of rotated. Um, you know, I, I specialize in enterprise risk management, and basically every few years, I'd, I'd rotate. I did counterparty risk management, and what that means is basically you, we look at the the companies Fannie Mae might do business with, and we analyze their financial statements to give an overall assessment. Then um, I did some work in interest rate risk management. So Fannie Mae had a liquidity portfolio about 800 billion in size, and and I was part of the team that did the interest rate risk reporting and then communicated that information with the trading team to discuss trading and hedging strategies. Um, and that was kind of most of my career there. And then I did a little bit of model risk management um, as well. And um, after being at Fannie for a few years, I felt like I was ready to try something else um, that was maybe a little bit closer to home. And, and uh, I found an opportunity at Navy Federal which is where I work right now in Vienna. Um, and uh, what I do there right now is uh, I sit in the capital markets desk and I support the capital markets group, uh, keep their models and assumptions up to date for the, the sales and trading desk. So I work very closely with the sales and trading team. Um, I'm also um, building out the team to establish relationships with the kind of middle office operations. Um, and I also work on the uh, valuation of our uh, mortgage servicing portfolio. So after basically the loans are sold to another investor, the bank might still choose to collect the principal and interest payments. And, uh, you know, because we do that service, there's a value for servicing the loans, and, and part of my job is to put a value on that and uh, pass it along. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Tim Keogh. I graduated in 1995 with a BS in finance. And when I left, I went into finance and I worked at Anderson Consulting, which is now Accenture, in their finance organization supporting the finance teams at big telecoms. And I stayed there for a little while and quickly figured out that was not for me. <laughs> so I moved on and went to a small startup and got my feet wet in kind of building technology startups. And I went that way ever since. So I've started up four or five companies now, sold a bunch of them to various uh, technology companies around the U.S. and the world, um, and have, uh, have been uh, kind of stuck in an unemployable state <laughs> where I can, only, uh, I can only work for myself now, I guess. Um, but so now I run two companies, actually, two technology companies. One is a reverse auction platform called With Me. And it's for bars and restaurants initially, but you say what you want to do, and the bars compete for, or restaurants compete for your business. And then I also run a, a company that uh, that builds development tools for technology uh, people, so designers or developers, to help make that process more efficient. Um, so most of my finance experience in my latter years has been, you know, running the the company and running the organization and having and supervising the finance operations. Uh, how's it going, everyone? I'm Brandon Sheplak, and I'm a financial analyst for the Federal Aviation Administration. I work in investment planning and analysis, our department. It's an independent group for the CFO, and essentially any special project that he has associated with trying to find the MPV, IRR, discount rate, or IRRs for any type of project that he may have. He pretty much calls down on, on us, and we analyze the cases, and then we provide a recommendation. Um, currently doing, I finished my CFA, and I'm currently at Georgetown uh, university doing my MSF. So that's cool. I don't know. Pass that mic. Down. All right. Come on. We got 18 mics. Uh, we'll see if this one works. How's this one? Yes? Okay, good. Um, so my name is Jason. Uh, Jason Howell, Jason Howell Company. I like my name. So I've used it a few times. Uh, I did not want to come here because my sister came to this school. And so why would I want to do everything my older sister did? But I did come here, and I came here by way of Nova. For any of you that transferred in, that's what I did. Uh, back in the, gosh, mid-90s when music was terrific. Uh, when I got here, though, I was pretty happy because there were so many things I could do at George Mason that I couldn't do at another school that I wanted to go to that will remain unmentioned. Um, majored in accounting, thought I was going to do that. Uh, was really, really hard for me. And uh, thank God you don't have to get stuck in your careers um, because I did graduate with an accounting degree by the skin of my teeth. And I uh, got into accounting, and it was really boring. Um, but I did stuff on the side to make it more fun, like doing accounting for musicians. I had my own company called 
Jason Howell Company, and I did um, you know musicians accounting, which was really fun. And I just kept doing different things to make my life more interesting, so that my career didn't have to be so dependent. Um, but I did accounting for about eight years. I um, also worked at a bank while I was in school, so that kind of cut my teeth on the financial world. And after a good bit of that, I decided to do something entirely different, which was recruiting. I was a headhunter for accounting and finance folks. Um, if you have a personality at all and you go to a headhunter, they're going to say, hmm, maybe you should work for us. Uh, and I said no. And then I got a job. And then they asked me again. And I said no. <laughs> and then they asked me a third time. And I said, you know, I am pretty bored. Yes, let's do it. Um, I did that for a few years, right during the time when you were starting to pay attention to the news and the market crashed in 2009. And um, I left that job because it was easier to make zero dollars at home than it was to make zero dollars at work. And um, eventually I wrote a little book and I ran for office in 2012, ran for U.S. Congress. Uh, guess what? I lost. <laughs> so uh, when I did lose, I decided I needed to find a way to get involved with humans but still make money because they don't pay you to run for office. And that's where financial planning came into, uh, came into my purview, which I think is a terrific career. It's a growing career, and we'll talk more about it. Thanks. Um, so let's, um, first question, draw on uh, your experiences and your expertise to help these guys out. And in your opinion, what qualities, courses, experience, skills, et cetera, uh, do you look for when hiring recent college graduates? And if you don't hire recent college <laughs> graduates, if you did hire recent college graduates, what, what kinds of things would you look for? I'll start, okay, Jason. Just, just to make it irregular. Um, so curiosity, that's the thing that I would look for. I actually plan to hire a couple people next year. Um, and if someone really wants to know, for example, how money works, then in my profession, that's a great person to hire because there's so much to learn and you never stop learning because things change, because these things are called laws and laws around money change all the time. So if you don't really care how it works, you're not gonna be able to help a lot of people. And so for me, it's intellectual curiosity. So I've hired uh, a lot of people in a lot of different roles, finance included, and I think the one thing that separates everybody out from the, the wheat from the chaff, in my opinion, is their kind of desire to achieve, right? So no matter what you want to do, if you're smart and capable, you can pretty much do anything that excites you in your career and that, you, that you're interested in. Um, and I've found that a lot of people that are trained in a certain profession or studied in a certain profession that have aptitude in that you know, field, like in finance, but they want to become a developer, a technologist, or a musician, or whatever, as long as they are excited and inspired by that and go after it, those people are people that I hire. I, I look at what their capabilities are, what I think they're, they, they're able to achieve, and also how they express themselves as to what they want to achieve. And that goal and that desire is like a big indicator for me as to success of somebody, you know, in their career path. So I, I haven't hired anyone um, out of school, <clears throat> but, you know, we are always looking for talent. And I think one of the things that I personally look for is um, kind of echoing along the same lines that you just heard, um, you know, to me, the way to make your resume stand out is to show that you are serious about your career. Um, and to me, that means either, you know, through some of your achievements, maybe you've had some big achievements. And if you're just starting out, maybe, you know, if it's finance that you're very, very serious about, you know, there are other professional designations that you could maybe uh, read about if you haven't heard about them already that per might pertain to your field. You know, if you're doing finance and technology, maybe you could do a, like a technology cert. If it's finance, you know, they have the FRM or, or CFA level one, um, you know, designations. And and that I think would speak loudly to employers saying that, hey, you know, this is a candidate that, although he doesn't have a lot of experience, but they're definitely still hungry. And I think, you know, hunger is what will drive, you know, make you stand out and, and you know, drive, drive, ultimately drive performance. So I'm going to go back to basics. And I have to say good listening skills, patience, 
an intense desire to learn, knowing what you're good at, and then some very basics. Good writing skills, good people skills, willingness to be a team player, and of course, good finance and math skills, knowing how to work an Excel spreadsheet, knowing how to read a financial statement, um, just knowing how to be, we heard the word intellectually curious, I think that's a good way to do it. A lot of what goes on in the financial planning business now, we're really focused on an aspect of finance called behavioral finance, which is what makes people tick and what makes them behave in a certain way and how to address those issues, which you can't get from learning the traditional rules of finance. So some things are changing, but an openness, um, good analytical skills, and good teamwork, and a desire to learn and listen, I think, count for a lot. I just want to echo what Judy just said about the analytical skills. I think this is extremely important. Um, and, you know, if the world right now is changing very in a very very fast pace and if you graduate here what you're graduating with what mason and, and other universities are preparing you for is to know the core building blocks but i think it's very essential that you take it upon yourselves to learn more above and beyond what you're taught here in the classroom even though you're finance focused if you graduate or if you start your profession with the attitude saying you know what i don't want to learn about technology i don't want to learn about you know, maybe basic querying of, of data, SQL, or, or, or B, other BI tools, um, you know, you won't be very successful in this career field. Um, you know, just speaking from, you know, what I see at big banks and large financial institutions, I mean, we grow, I monitor the consumption of data, and it's growing at an exponential pace. Um, and so if you want to make yourself stand out, you have to learn basic SQL, learn SAS, Learn R, go to Coursera, you know, go to lynda.com, learn these skills. They're essential. I see so many resumes that have just the basic, you know, finance background, and, and there, there aren't enough people out there that know the fundamentals of how to query, group, and, and analyze data. And I think that's why the, in more recent years you're seeing this kind of growth of, of uh, you know, data scientists. You know, you didn't used to see this four or five years ago. Um, but it's becoming more and more relevant in today's world. Look at Goldman Sachs. They had like, you know, maybe 600, north of 600 traders on the floor and completely wiped out now by the quants. So, you know, know your, you know, study the, your, 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 you know, quantitative skills, um, you know, try to get good at math, um, you know, learn basic programming. Um, I think it'll take you a long way. A lot of folks are kind of initially scared by it, but, you know, if you take the time to go through it, um, I think that'll really make you stand out. So one thing, especially a, a lot of you guys I know are early in your uh, uh, academic uh, careers, when you're doing course selection, if you pay attention to the advice, uh, I think it's excellent. Um, it can influence the kinds of courses that, that you choose to make sure that when you come out, you have that skill set that's going to be valued by the employers that you're most interested. Uh, so let's turn the spotlight back on you guys. Um, I have two questions. I'll ask both because they're kind of opposite sides of the same coin. Um, what have you enjoyed most or found most rewarding during your career? And then the flip side, um, what have you enjoyed least or found least rewarding uh, during your career? So basically, you know, what have you liked the most and what have you not liked the most? And I don't know, I guess Brendan or um, Scott, does one of you guys want to start? Since yeah. So uh, one of the things I've liked the most is going up to see the CFO. It's a rewarding challenge to kind of present your beliefs and your opinion to the CFO, the head honcho pretty much in our organization. Yeah. So uh, that was probably one of the most rewarding aspects of my job. Um, one of the least rewarding aspects is... Or really, it could also be just what you like least. Yeah, I guess, I mean, I really don't have too much that I don't like about my current job. I'm pretty happy there, so... I really couldn't tell you anything. For community banking, it's, it's a world in and of itself. It's, it's, it's very different uh, operationally than a lot of the big banks or certainly a credit union like Navy Federal Credit Union with $70 billion in assets. And it, it, uh, community banks can function a lot like startups because every day-to-day, -day, 
there are new capabilities that the bank needs that it just doesn't have yet. And the, a, a young person coming in or somebody who's got the, uh, the intellectual curiosity is widely re read, is looking at the latest uh, literature about that stuff, can add, really add a lot of value to a community bank. And I certainly did that in my career. As I was coming up, I tried to, um, I, and I started mostly working at small banks, you know, $200 million in assets, basically startups. You know, we, they just raised capital, got a banking charter, and opened the doors, and now you figure out what you have to do. And again, so then you have that, those same day-to-day -day where you, 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 it's, a, it's a mystery, right? You, you've got to figure it out. What is the next thing that needs to be done? And that's very rewarding. But I've also, in that, one of those things I had to do was be a lender, and that means you made loans, and now you've got to get people to pay you back. And so now you're going out and finding, hey, why didn't you make your payments? And that's obviously not uh, a happy situation for anybody, either the borrower or the, or the lender. And so, but again, that's obviously part and parcel of being in banking. So being in community banking, being able to determine, set the fate, because a community bank and organization is just who it hires, right? The, the bank itself becomes the people that it, that it hires and, and the directions that those employees and managers take that bank becomes the bank. Um, and again, the same the customers who, who bank with you. And again, that part of it is very rewarding. Uh, but uh, there are also the parts where you're like, hey, you didn't make your payment. And maybe you can pawn that off. If you specialize in something better, you can pawn that off on somebody else who's more uh, uh, co constitutionally developed to deal with those kinds of stories. So I would say that, uh, you know, much like the community bank role, like it's a startup role where you're starting a company. One of the most rewarding things is taking an idea, for me at least, taking an idea and seeing it through to kind of through the gestation to where it's a real product, where you really have business, where you really have something that people want. Um, and that's really exciting to me. You're kind of nurturing something and seeing it grow. And certainly you have things coming at you in all different ways, depending on how you, you know, what you need to prioritize, very different things. You need to figure out what the path forward is going to be. Um, you need to identify changes in course, all that kind of stuff, which to me is really fun. It's almost the uncertainty, the risk of it is, is very interesting to me. One of the reasons I got into this world was because I figured out pretty quickly I'm not a bureaucracy type guy. I'm not a guy who fit well into the like Anderson Consulting culture, like I did fine, but it was not my thing where I, I – See, you're here two years, you get, you get promoted. You're here four years, you get to be a senior analyst or whatever. That, that's not for me. I'd much rather have, you know, I, I much prefer people that work with me, that are on the team with me, people who want to go up as quick as possible, want to do as much as possible, as fast as possible. That's a more, to me, it's a more real world, you know, reality. It's less of this scale and more of everybody can achieve whatever they want to achieve, and you should get there as fast as you can uh, if that's what you want to do, right? right. Right. I mean, like, so what, what Tim's saying, when I graduated, I was really excited because it was close, right? Um, and so I got, I took my first job, and when I graduated, there were lots of job opportunities. So I was lucky that in the mid-90s, people were hiring a lot. But once I started working, I realized the thing I hated most was people telling me what to do. And people telling me how to do it. And it felt like school. It did feel like more amateur, like didn't I just graduate from this? And there's a balance in that because if someone's going to tell you what to do and how to do it, for some people that's great because it's really easy and now I can go. Uh, some employers, some bosses are really good at that and they tell you exactly what to do and they're very clear and then you, you go to lunch and then you go to happy hour. But some bosses will tell you that and they're not very clear and they're not very sure. And so they're telling you what to do, maybe how to do it, you do it, it's wrong. What? And so that was annoying. And as I got later and later into my career, I realized what I really did want, and I knew this already, was to start my own firm. The benefit of starting your own firm is not that you're going to be rich immediately because you're not, but it is that freedom that idea that you are adulting, to use a phrase maybe from your vernacular, um, that you are, you are doing this and you're taking leadership in your life and in your career and you're about to create something that you imagined. The downside is you may have to worry about the bills every single month if you actually have enough money with your imagination. Um, so there's a balance there. But just like the career, there's a balance in people telling you what to do and how to do it and whether you appreciate that for a while. And then there's a balance in entrepreneurship where you have all the freedom, 
but you've got to make the money so you can pay your bills or you're going to be asking your parents or your very good friends or your girlfriend or boyfriend for some money. Um, so there's, there isn't a black and white on, you know, well, I guess I should just have my own career and, and do the Anderson Consulting um, or I should just start a business. It depends on where you are in your life, how you feel, and what you're willing to essentially endure for a period of time. What I love most is that no two days are alike, and sometimes no two hours are alike. There's a lot of creative problem solving, and I'm going to echo what Tim had to say in terms of really uh, just focusing and helping. We help our clients who are very busy entrepreneurs, C-level executives, uh, business owners. Um, we work a lot with women, a lot with families, navigate the uncertainties of life. So uh, every day I get up and I watch Bloomberg and I look to see what the day might be like because of what's been happening overseas and in the U.S. And then we help guide our clients. And that's what I love the most is the creative problem solving and working with clients, helping them plan and have the wealth in their lives and the kinds of lives that they want to have and leave legacies, whether it's for their employees or whether it's for themselves and their families. What do I not love? We probably said this, somebody else said it a little differently is the crazy regulations and rules that we sometimes have to follow that make absolutely no sense and to interpret them for our clients in a way that they can understand them even if they don't agree with them and we have some going on now. So the ups and downs in the markets kind of provide some excitement. Uh, we always like the ups, we don't love the downs so much, but there's a lot of hand holding and a lot of knowing that you can make a difference in the lives of a group of individuals and uh, their employees in some cases that you would otherwise not be able to make. I think it's important for people to know that <clears throat> whatever you decide to do, whether you work for an employer or yourself, y you, you will always have things that you like and don't like to do. Um, that's the truth. And what's going to make you stand out as you enter the workforce is doing everything in a positive attitude and doing it well without taking any shortcuts and but all, well, in balancing that at the same time with communicating with your direct report saying, you know, hey, I did this and I did that. I, I would prefer to work more on, on X instead of Y because it gives me more job satisfaction. That's fair. But, you know, sometimes there are things that you just have to do that you don't like. And so just keep in mind to keep that positive attitude. And sometimes the things that you don't like would lead to things that you eventually like. What I mean by that is, Let's say that you have the mindset, you know, I'm a finance guy I'm a, or I'm a quant guy and, or, you know, I only want to work on valuation work. Um, that's what I love about finance. You know, I just want to, you know, slap a multiple on something and say it's worth X or Y and, and here's the business case and, and here's the scenario analysis and here, the, you know, or whatever. Uh, but sometimes you got to do some data mining and, and you may not like data mining. Um, but I think it's, you know, you need to know a little bit of everything and do a little bit of everything with, with a positive attitude that I think would, would really uh, take you a long way. Just to add to what Will said, um, and this connects to what you said before, too, about learning all these different things that you may not care about. The people that get to the CFO level, the person that, you know, Brandon's reporting to, they're people that know a little bit about everything. Um, and like Judy and myself, as financial planners, we have to know a little bit about estate planning, a little bit about taxes, a little bit about, uh, gosh, budgeting, behavior, uh, a little bit about insurance, life insurance, car insurance, house insurance. We can't be experts in all those categories, uh, but we have to know a little bit about it, and that way we provide some value to our clients or our coworkers. And if you're working in a firm, then you will get promoted because you're able to communicate with the IT people and the finance people and the accounting people and the admin. If you don't know anything about a category, it's very difficult to promote you, at least to promote you and have you succeed. So, um, yeah, great point, William, about knowing a little bit about everything. Thanks. Um, before we go to the next question, I just want to follow up on what Will was saying, too. As far as being somebody that kind of brings their A game to stuff that they may not necessarily like, pay attention to detail. That's the I try to teach that in my class that especially that comes up if you're doing something you don't like, if it's like data entry or something that might seem a little bit tedious. Pay attention to detail. Bring your A game. That impresses, you know, the people you work with, and it opens up doors uh, to do the big kinds of things that you're interested in doing. 
So I've asked all the questions so far, so I will uh, turn it over to you guys uh, if you have any questions uh, for our panelists and uh, see what is on your mind and what they can uh, help uh, answer for you. I learned Excel in college. <laughs> um, so, you know, when people, employers were like, do you know Excel? I said, what are you talking about? Of course I know Excel. Um, so it was great to have that skill. And you'd be surprised at how many people don't understand that easy program, not to mention the ones William were talk was talking about. So, um, you know, get your Microsoft applications down and, uh, and then get a few more that William mentioned. So I would say uh, corporate finance is definitely one that I use every day. Um, MPV, IRRs. BC ratios, and I know they teach that here. So um, Mason really had a great foundation for finance for me, and I think it really paid off for me. So, can you repeat that, please? yeah, so MPV, net present value, internal rate of return, and BC ratio, benefit cost ratio. So for the government, BC ratios are pretty big. And if I'm not mistaken, I think the School of Management does have a Bloomberg terminal. You can go uh, find that. and. Again, you won't have anything to actually do with it, but pull up a QCIP, find a security, find a mortgage-backed security, uh, familiarize yourself with some of those uh, <clears throat> features because, again, a lot of the finance classes you'll take in college are related to equity. And, and it's, it's a great thing to study. It's a great thing to test somebody on because a share has got a price and every share is the same. But with a fixed income security, they're all different. Right? They all have their own features and maturities and optionality and uh, very, you know, much harder to write a test on and score 30 students or what. So, uh, and, and also not right, anybody else going anywhere else knowing the particular features of any particular collateralized mortgage obligation is just not going to come up in dinner party conversation. It doesn't happen. But if you can spend some time, and they have the resources here at, at the school, you, your professors might not pull you into it, but you just ask them about it and they'll show you where it is. So. So I'll take it. I'll take it back a step. It's good. Um, economics, finance, corporate finance, uh, any kind of personal finance you can get. Because even if you don't need it for work, you're going to need it for yourself to be successful. Um, good analytic skills, however you get them, and that could be through something outside of the School of Management. It could be through a political science class or some other social service related class, but good ways to think about things. And uh, I'm going to tell you that, and I was not a great student the first time around at this, statistics. I use, and this is really, I think, in part what, 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 what we're talking about here is statistics. I use all kinds of finance-related statistical data every single day in my business when I'm trying to analyze whether it's investments or looking at risk management or trying to understand that. So don't blow it off, whether you're looking at it in terms of an actual statistics class or an operations research class, some kind of decision science, or whether it's through an information technology class. Um, they all matter, and eventually, if you do a good job, maybe not year one or year two of your career, but somewhere along the line, it's all going to come together and make sense in a way that you never imagined that it would. Um, I use pretty much everything that I learned in both my master's degrees, both in my MBA and also in my international relations career every single day. So don't take them for granted. Um, and when you figure out what you think you might want to do, um, ask what tools you need to know so that you can start to prepare. I thank you, Judy. I, I agree everything Judy said. And when I was in your shoes, um, I just remember thinking to myself, you know, stats. I, I don't really care too much about that. Oh, you know, programming. Uh, that's I'm finance. You know, that, that's I want the cool stuff. I want to trade some equities. Come on. But the the truth is, the real world relies heavily on statistics. Um, I mean, depending on what you end up specializing in. Obviously, but it, from my experience, if if you could complement your financial studies with statistics, 
combined with you know coursework and and just learning how to use uh, SQL or SAS, um, I think you'd you'd resume would really stand out in terms of. Uh, what coursework really helped me, I think just understanding how to analyze financial statements is really important because, you know, it, it's important in the equity world and even in the fixed income world, you know, it, it can be uh, important. Um, just to give you an idea of, of just kind of the, the fixed income market and job opportunities uh, that could be out there, um, in 2004, the, the, the mortgage debt and equity market was about $8.1 trillion. Uh, 2016, it stands at about 11 trillion. About 8.8 .8 billion of that is in mortgage-backed securities. Um, there's about 11.5 trillion in U.S. equity outstanding. We have about 40 trillion in bonds right now, and 13.3 of that is in treasuries. 8.5 is in corporate bonds. 3.8 is in munis. I quote these numbers to, to make a point that I think there are a lot of job opportunities when it comes to. You know, you could use the skills that we're talking about in statistics, valuation, um, even looking at the financial statements. You know, if you're investing in corporate bonds or muni bonds, I mean, you got to you got to understand the financials of, of the company you're buying the bonds from. You're, you you need quant guys because when you value MBS, you think about what assumptions that you, that go into the valuation of a mortgage. You need a you know a home price model, a prepayment model, a default model. Um, and you know, when I worked at Fannie Mae, they, they had teams of, of of modelers doing working on each of these models, and then they all kind of come together together to value your security. Um, and so, again, I'm I, you know, if, if there's anything you, you take away from me, it's you know, learn your stats, learn some SQL. Um, if you can start pursuing you know a, a CFA, you could do that in your senior year. I think for me that helped me out a lot. Um, it made me stand out. You know, maybe with all the resumes, you know, they they see that you know that on your resume, they're like, you know what, everyone kind of looks the same. This guy seems more motivated. Let's give him a chance, and that kind of worked out for me in a lot of ways. The other thing that helped me in my career is don't wait until a job is posted. Try to network. Um, you know, I've I've gotten some great opportunities in my career by, for example, working at a company. You know. I graduated doing accounting work, which sucked for me as a finance guy. You know, they're saying like, okay, make sure that these numbers tick and tie with last year's. <laughs> I, anyway, it was bad. And the way I got out of it was, you know, I leveraged where I worked to go set up meetings with other VPs and SVPs at the company. I was like, you know what, I, I'm kind of interested in capital markets, so let me go talk to, you know, the SVP of capital markets. and. And lo and behold, like three weeks later, the, the VP called me and he said, hey, Will, I have this job that's not even posted yet. Would you be interested? And I'm like, oh, sweet. You know, finally, this is my, my big break. And, and it worked out for me. And, and um, you know, I think there were one or two other times that that, that happens. And, you know, now we're, you know, we're, we're trying to grow and, and it's hard to get good resumes through the door. And so, you know, I'm trying to leverage, for example, for example my network to hire, you know, good talent. Um, so definitely, you know, if there, you know, the other thing to take away from this is, is your network. Um, you know, bi work on building your network. George Mason has a great network, um, and um, that that that's all I have. So I'll just echo what a lot of people said here. I when I went to school, I did not take any technology courses. To I took MIS. That's about it, and that. Everybody, I think, can see the writing on the wall. Like, technology is ingrained in everything now. So if you can't speak at least part of the language to communicate with everybody else that's, that's uh, around the world, you're, you're in trouble. Like, so you need to know something about it. I mean, think of every industry where big data, that phrase, is used in every single industry now. It doesn't matter what you're talking about, whether you're mining aggregates or you're, you're uh, building models to trade, trade stocks or equities or what have you. So, like, I would – spend time, you know, at least getting uh, familiar with it, if not uh, gaining some level of expertise. The other thing I, I see often, because I do a lot of mentoring for startups and other people that want to go on the entrepreneurship path, and I see a lot of people that have graduated with a degree or have a, a, an industry focus, so let's take accounting, not that I'm beating up on accounting, um, but there are a lot of folks that are really good accountants. They're good at ticking and tying the numbers, and those are valid and, and necessary functions, but 
you need to be able to step back and, and look at kind of the overall picture of the business. And that's one of the things I enjoyed from my finance courses here was saying what, you know, that's great and all that we got the accounting laid out, but where is, is this business headed anywhere? So it's very, it's oftentimes I see people that are looking for a job. The people that do really well in roles are the ones that can tie into a lot of these other experiences. So Jason kind of mentioned the CFO has all of these different talents they've built up over a career. And the people that think about, hey, I'm going to build some software. I'm not just here to build, build that software. I'm here to build the best piece of software that aligns with the business. Or I'm here to do the accounting, and I'm doing the accounting, but I can identify perhaps ways that we can be more efficient or ways that you can improve or I can understand better how it fits within the overall organization. Where is the you know, pricing models? All those types of things come up, right? And so I think the more you have a grasp of these different elements of the whole business, the better served you are and the better served your employer is, uh, be it yourself or be it some other employer. Um, so I think those like kind of understanding the holistics of business, how you do stuff, how you model out things, how you would you would uh, plan something. Those have served me really well in terms of building out business models and, and those types of things on which you can execute. Um, and then the last point, this is just a broader entrepreneurship comment. Um, I see all too often folks that have, if you're interested in the entrepreneurship track, um, they have a great idea. This is the number one, you know, an excellent idea to build a whatever. And I'm going to poke fun at a recent public company, Snap. They don't have a business model. Like, they don't know how to make money. They know how to spend it, but they don't know how to make it. <laughs> and so that's a critical piece of the pie. Like, you're, you're never going to have a really, truly successful, dur uh, uh, durable, lasting company without a real plan to execute on a business, which means you have to extrapolate up from the weeds of whatever your function is to the, the bigger picture of how do we grow this from nothing to something that's actually profitable and, and can exist. Thanks. Uh, there's a lot of great information in there. Um, a lot of the skills that got mentioned, uh, Excel, uh, Bloomberg, um, stats, uh, analytical skills, um, some programs, um, modeling, um, a lot of that's covered in a lot of the upper level finance courses. Certain ones focus on certain elements more than others. So those of you guys that are interested in finance, once you start getting into course selection, that's when it um, is very useful to come talk to, you know, advisors and, you know, folks in the finance area to help figure out what the best courses are uh, to help develop those skills. So I'll turn it back to you guys. I think I saw you had your hand up before. Why don't you go ahead? See, uh, you know, here you, you just have to get the general skills of know, knowing how to research, knowing how to find new information, because regulations change so fast, the technology changes so fast, and the, the needs of whatever business you find yourself uh, either inside of or consulting to are so idiosyncratic. It just, the, your professors can't tell you what you're going to need 20 years from now or, or 13 years from now. It's very, very difficult for them to tell you what you're going to need to know one or two years from now, especially when financial crises occur, <clears throat> the government can change the rules of the game. So really it is the fundamentals of, of, of the statistical ratios, of financial ratios, understanding a balance sheet, and, and the basics of accounting. But, but from then on, it's it's going to be your drive. And, and, and you learn that in college, by the way. I mean, the drive that you get, uh, you, you are on your own. The professor says, here's some good ideas. Go learn them. He'll test you, he or she will test you on them later. But if you got them or not, that's on you, right? They're not going to sit in your dorm and help you do the math. Um, you might be able to go to office hours sometimes. But, the, uh, but that, that's the skill, right, is that being knowing how to find things, uh, knowing what it is that uh, you can find that you're good at. Because, again, the, the needs of the business you're going to find yourself in are going to be so uh, uh, unique to, to that particular case in time. And then the needs of Eagle Bank's balance sheet, which is a bit changing. We try to grow about a billion dollars a year. Uh, going from a, a $2 billion bank to a $7 billion bank in, in five years, 
It's, a, it's just a different animal. So you ha just have to know how to roll with all those punches, and that's what college is setting you up for, I think. Let me uh, try to answer that, too. Is it Arian? My, my eyesight's still pretty good, even though I'm over 40. Adrian, not as good as I hoped. Um, you're in college. What year are you? You're a junior. Um, how many uh, juniors and seniors are in the room? All right, so you've, you've had some experiences already. I mean, the, you asked what was um, an impactful experience in college that made me, you know, strong in my career. Um, gee, I transferred to Mason in 95, so I missed you by a semester. Um, I didn't want to go here, but there was another girl going here from Nova, and I thought that would be terrific. I can date her. Um, and so for all of the fall semester, I tried to date her, and she wouldn't let me date her. And I was very sad, and I got a D in finance because I was sad. <laughs> so I took the class over, and I passed it, and that was good. Um, and then I took another level accounting course, which was quite boring for me, and I failed it. And I had never gotten an F ever. And transcripts, when you get an F, it's 0.0, .0 credit. It's like I didn't even show up. I fell asleep studying for that class almost every night. I tried, but I failed. So I had a decision to make, because my parents, my dad, asked me, why don't you just get out of accounting? I was in accounting when I was in school. I switched my major to something else. I already knew that. And a lot of people I spoke with went into MIS because you could get an accounting degree and make $28,000 in 1997, or you can get an MIS degree, which was Management Information Systems, so IT, and make 40000 So all the good-looking people left accounting, and they went to MIS. They're also the smart people. I decided, you know what, I'm just going to stay in accounting. I'm going to learn it. I'm not going to quit. I don't care how long it takes me. So I took it over and I got a C. I ended up taking about three, maybe, yeah, three accounting courses in my last semester because I wanted it to be my last semester so I could graduate with everybody else. And I called this thing called 4GMU. It's what we used to have before we used the internet a lot. It was a phone service, and you had to call it and then hear your grades, and it said intermediate accounting two, C. I'm like, was that a C or a D? So I called again, and they said C. I'm like, I think it said C. I called one more time, and it said C. I'm like, that's a C. I passed. I went right to the bookstore and bought an alumni sweatshirt that I still have, and I got an accounting degree. And it was a great experience. I mean, that is what pushed me through accounting for a bunch of years. It pushed me through failing my bid for Congress. It pushed me through being broke when I started my company. That is something you're going to carry with you, um, and that's what I learned from college. I want to take a slightly different tack at this in, in terms of what you asked, uh, because George Mason has some capabilities that you don't often find in a university. Um, and one of them, and I don't think any of you is too young or too old for this, um, there's a tool out that's run by Gallup, and I forget, maybe you know which group it is. It's called Strength Finders. Have any of you heard of that? So I highly encourage each of you to take the time when you're not overtired and overstressed to go through that process. I think all too often we, uh, at least in our culture and society, we always try to get better at what we're not good at. I'm, I'm just going to follow on a little bit what Jason said. But I think what's really important is to know who you are as a person and to know what your aptitudes and your attitudes are. And one of the ways that you can find that out is to go through the experience of the Strength Finders and some counseling on that. And it may help you before you graduate to either rethink or focus your energies and your efforts in an area where you can excel. To know, uh, to, it, it, some of it's a, a little personality, some of it's talents and strengths. But play to your talents and your strengths and don't worry about the things that you aren't great at. Find your way into a team that you can work with where um, you said, you know, if you, if you uh, Scott was talking about it before we started, you know, if you're not great at math, find a great mathematician to hang out with. But just really think about that and don't worry so much about the things that you just aren't so terrific at. Think about what you love to do, what you're passionate about, what you want to learn more about, and what you are good at doing 
and that will get you a long way towards success in life. Yeah, Judy's right. And and if you are interested in something, you're not so good at it. I can tell you, I did a, a stint as a headhunter. I mentioned the people who actually got the jobs weren't necessarily the straight A students. They were the people who were pretty good students or pretty good professionals and had a great personality. When you're getting hired for a job, you're getting hired to work with people. So it's super that you're smart, but if you're no fun to be with, if you're no, if you're not great to be with, if people don't think you're going to be a good listener, um, a good coworker, then I may as well hire someone else that might be maybe not as bright as you, but I'm going to get along with them and they're going to be on a good teammate. So think of that. Any other questions? Yes, way in the back. I'll start and I'll finish very quickly. Um, I have a weekly planner that I develop and I work that plan. I try not to get distracted more than necessary, but I know what I need to get done in any given week and I just try to pay attention to it. I'll tell you the death of productivity is email. So yes, um, <laughs> so uh, n not looking at email more than twice a day unless I happen to be writing the email has turned out to be equally important. So for me, one of the things I've done, and I've, I've gone the exact opposite way that I think you should go, where you work all the time and, and don't really have as much of a, a social or outside life. Um, but what I found very that helps me a lot is every morning I'll wake up early and I'll read the newspaper, I'll read the Wall Street Journal. And then I also make a point that I have two kids and I make a point that I always am home or at their games or whatever it is, doesn't matter what's going on. Everything else doesn't matter as much. And so you have to have that balance, which I was very bad at, so I can actually see the, the difference. <laughs> um, and it's, it's absolutely obvious how, how much I missed out on um, when, I was, when I was focusing only on work. And part of that is, you know, as you go along in your day, you're only so, you're, you're incrementally more effective every hour or, increment, or uh, largely or uh, less effective every hour you work after a certain point. Yeah. So it, it's much better to kind of, I, I find it's good to start my day off engaging my mind with something different, and then I can flow into it. Also, exercise. Although I'm kind of fat, it's, uh, it's good to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's just being of a certain age. And yeah. So I guess one thing that I would say is check the news. I read the markets every day. Uh, and then the other thing is I check with my boss every day. So I talk to him and see what anything that he needs me to do for that day. And, um, you know, just checking with the boss. So that's one of my... Thanks. Everyone knows you, you should study and you should work hard and you should do all of these things. So it kind of warps your mind into thinking, well, I got to keep doing the work as much as I can. I haven't studied enough. I feel bad. I'm insecure about it. Uh, try this trick, and it is a trick but because it, it works, but it's counterintuitive. Schedule your breaks. Tell your brain, I get to take a break at 2 o'clock. So from now to 2 o'clock, I just need to work. You're going to see that 2 o'clock coming, and you're going to say, oh, my gosh, I'm going to take a break soon. I better study. And it's going to sort of jazz you up a little bit to actually do the work so that you can go ahead and take that break. So schedule your breaks. Schedule your dates. Um, you know, schedule your email. Make sure that you know when you're going to do it. And your brain won't be worried while you're studying, while you're working. When are we going to check the email? When are we going to check Facebook? When are we going to have a break? That's what your brain is worrying about most of the time. So do it in the reverse, and you'll, you'll find that it actually works. I'll throw in just two common sense ones. Um, get a decent night's sleep regularly and eat well. Um, sometimes people, but especially college students, forget about those. And the night before an exam, that's not the time to study all night long. That's the, night, that's the time to, to get a good night's sleep. Um, so we're... At 11, um, I think we might have time for one more question from the students. Yes.
your question about language skills then? Should you have a second language? Yeah. They said you start? Yeah, that, my, my thought on that is I haven't hired specifically for that, but I've encountered this before. And a lot of times I look at it, so people look at it that, you know, English is your second language. That's a bad thing. Now, maybe you're not quite as good at English. I always looked at it the reverse. It's I'm hiring somebody that speaks English better than most people I know, <laughs> and also speaks another language, which I don't speak. So why wouldn't I want to augment my team with somebody that has those capabilities that also has the, you know, the core stuff? So I'm, I feel like I'm getting a bonus. So, but I may look at it differently than other people. I don't know. Well, what's the, what's the language people should speak when they come out of school? I know you've got the right answer on this one. <laughs> come on, give me the right one. Um, I think... I mean, to answer your question, that it depends on exactly what kind of career path, you know, you're, you're trying to do. Um, you know, in the world of finance, you know, you, know, the, the, you find you encounter certain, for example, cultures or, or groups of people that, you know, their English isn't their first language, but they're, like, phenomenal at modeling or they're phenomenal at, you know, programming, um, you know, uh, so – you know, just it depends if uh, it just depends exactly kind of you know what career you're you're trying to to choose. I, I knew you'd say. get it. Programming language. That's another <laughs> language. Yeah. <laughs> so if you want a second language, that's a great one to go yeah, for. It I is. I don't have it. In community banking, uh, it's not so much a, a, much at Eagle yeah, Bank, right. but uh, I know certainly at Virginia Heritage, a prior bank that I was at, we had a, a large uh, Korean community customer base. And so the people who could speak Korean and also English and uh, the more technical finance terms to be able to translate back and forth. Uh, when I was at a bank called Alliance Bank, which is now part of uh, Washington First, they, they had the Chinese community, uh, Chinese immigrants and Chinese business owners. And so, again, having that sort of skill, being able to speak in both worlds, certainly. But, it, and again, community banking is still a customer business, so being able to Find the, speak to your customers and approach the customers in the language that the customers want to speak uh, makes a big difference. But again, then you've got to come back and sell it to the organization, write up the loan, write up, and, and being, being able to put the, the numbers on pieces of paper as well. So that'll wrap it up for the uh, question part. Um, what we'll do now is... Um, I'll invite the uh, students to stay and network, and if you guys have any questions, to go ahead and ask the panelists. Uh, before we wrap it up, on behalf of George Mason uh, University and the School of Business, students, faculty, and staff, I'd like to extend a thank you to our panelists uh, for coming. Um, Jason Howell, um, Scott Clark, uh, Judy Redpath, uh, Brendan Shepelak, uh, William Tabry, and uh, Tim Keogh. Um, I think it was a really impressive group. I think they gave a lot of good information. Um, one of the things that you guys probably are thinking is, wow, you know, that's the Mason alums, you know, the kinds of things that they've done, I'm perfectly capable of doing, especially if I, you know, listen to the things that they said and use that as I plan and move forward uh, here at school and beyond. Um, so again, thank you so much for taking your time to be with us and sharing uh, so many uh, useful uh, uh, things with our, with our students, and um, that's it. So feel free if you guys have questions. Hey, well, you, what part of uh, Fannie Mae did you work for? Um, yeah, man. A little bit of everything. <laughs> yeah. That's terrific. Who do you? Uh, I work for now. What's uh, uh, financial rank? planning. I, uh, uh, no. It was for Annette. Yeah. It was tough, yeah. I heard. I didn't know. I had it. For her? I so had it. I was dying for somebody to ask that question. Yeah. Did you have a clue? Yeah. No. What year? I was moving for um, my, look, my roommate. Yeah. His father was. Yeah, I mean, last it's, year it's been for a lot about of entrepreneurship year. in and out, whether I had a career. Tough. I heard she is tough. I over there, I said, oh, you're graduating. Do you, are you looking for a job? And I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Manage the band. Yeah. 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 It's not. Uh, it's it didn't come up in this panel, but yeah, the other ones have made yeah, a point. Um, <laughs> no 
Nobody nobody grows up and oh, yeah. 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 like it's just hey, you know, and they're not thinking about Main Street Bank, Freedom Bank, yeah. Eagle Bank, no. Washington First no. Bank. They, they know Wells Fargo, they know Brand. There's so many of these community banks around I did. which will give you opportunities to do all kinds of things. Figure out what yeah, it is. But you, you just won't know that that exists. Oh, nice. Because it's not in your consciousness. And I work, yeah, I work yeah, for banks yeah. too, so yeah, much. Absolutely. That's awesome. By the way, you started your own you know, company. That's awesome. Thanks for hiring me. You know, I've always thought about it. I thought I knew that. Right. Right. I mean, I have. Hey, how are you doing? Tim. Nice to meet you. Embers Technology. So it's a best. Somebody knew they were on the other end of the phone line. So we had dollar transactions. Nobody told me I couldn't do it. Yeah. Well, of course I did. Yeah. It. So I was in what was in the wire transfer. So they're trying to build a platform. Oh, and I created jobs every time I was in the I think we will have some, perfect. but we are not finalizing. Right. 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 But uh, I can give you a card. Oh, we have a student and then that present value. It's kind of interesting. Makes sense to implement. I had no idea this was right. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, All right. That's really the. How you doing? Well, and that's why I tried to make that point. They can't tell us what you need in 20 years. Hi. So it's, you have like, if you're trying to do like a software development effort, it's going to cost you yeah. benefits associated with it. Uh, Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> what that capability does. I don't, I don't use Facebook. Really. 